Um, so today we're just going to talk briefly about financial education delivery methods. And as we do this, we'll, we'll um, share a little bit about some um, things that we've done along the way as well. A lot of the examples that you'll see in the presentation are from our uh, Military Family Learning Network, and um, they've just changed their name to one op. So you'll probably see uh, MFLN listed along the way. And um, that's because we've had opportunities, particularly um, educators, um, Sarah Crimans and Anita Harris Herring have been involved a lot in um, doing some work with um, the Military Families Learning Network. So they have some good examples in here of what has been done. And you know what? Okay, there it is. I was going to say it's not moving for me. <laughs> okay, um, so here are some examples of different uh, delivery methods that uh, could be considered in financial education. Um, you see here everything from the fi financial classes. And again, talks about its content focused and strengthening. What I like about this grid is, and I think you, you've seen it probably in the modules as well, uh, talks about who the target audience might be and um, where they might be in, in their financial life. Um, looking at they're generally stable, but there may be some in, in crisis as well. Uh, the providers there would probably be trained in financial education and have professional expertise um, and knowledge and would be able to teach and guide people along to find resources that would help them in, in what they're looking to achieve. Um, you see financial planning, that's going to be very different. Uh, I was just teaching a class yesterday and we started out talking about savings. And um, even though I hadn't expected it from this group, we ended up talking a little bit about investments. And you know that if you're a financial educator, that is probably not your um, strong suit in, in uh, investments. And so, um, you know, that's going to be somebody who is a little bit different in target audience, likely stable in their situation. And um, that may be a process of being a one-to-one -one setting or um, focused on their longer term, perhaps their investment goals, things like that. You see coaching, Coaching, mentoring, and counseling all together there are um, kind of interesting because coaching has, has been a fairly new development in um, the financial education area. And you see there, that's focused on behavior change. Um, again, that might be a little bit more of a one-to-one -one or it might be a, um, a little shorter term kind of thing. It's similar to the mentoring. Uh, you see that the mentoring there is more experience focused and then counseling situation focused and the audience might change a little bit there. They may be stable in their financial situation and the mentoring and the counseling, they may, may be moving more, um, maybe in more of that area of in crisis and in the counseling, looking at remediation of a situation um, or trying to prevent something. So more situational in what's happening. And then case management, um, I, that one dealing a little bit more with focus on resources, finding the resources to help with a specific need. Um, generally the situation would, there would be in crisis and uh, perhaps, you know, being referred to um, someone that would be able to assist with financial education um, to meet their specific needs. So you can see differences as we go along there. Um, oops, did it move? Up? Okay, no, I guess that's right. Um, a wraparound, we talk about wraparounds a lot with the education that we provide. And that's basically anything that extends the learning beyond the formal learning process. And you determine what that formal learning process actually would be. So it's outside of the formal learning, but can enhance the formal learning as well. Um, and for MFLN, this is a, a kind of a mind map that they had of um, their, their, how they perceived wraparound education. And you see the formal learning there in the webinars. 
Um, and from the webinars, there was discussion, there was blog, blogs and vlogs, social media and podcasts. So although the, the formal learning was the webinar, they tried to do other things that wrapped around that would help in um, enhancing that learning situation. And so um, these were all examples of things that they might do in order to enhance the learning. Um, those wraparounds can be before, during, and after. They can be at any time in the process. So you see here in, in before, that might introduce a concept or it might provide some resources um, so that during, let's say it's a webinar, for example. Um, so we might provide some resources before the webinar so that people could have an opportunity to read and react to or view and uh, view a video perhaps, or listen to a podcast and to um, think about what that meant to them. And then during the webinar, it might be a matter of, okay, so let's talk about what you saw and what you, um, or what you heard or read and um, to be able to engage people around that situation. And then after, again, it might extend the learning, provide an opportunity to, um, to apply that content in some way. And so you can see that the wraparounds can, um, can really enhance the education and the engagement um, at any stage. So let's think about some examples of wraparounds if you care to share any um, examples that you have seen or you can think of related to what we just showed with that kind of a mind map and um, how we might think about wraparound education. Yeah, I'll say now with um, in the past two years, we learned to do more learning um, virtually, just like we're doing now. So we've been conducting, I, I work closely with some housing agencies, nonprofits in the, in the Twin Cities, like uh, Neighbor, Neighbor Works Home Partner, Partners, and NIDA, and CLUES. So they've all adapted this doing the home ownership courses online. And the turnout, the turnout is higher than what it was in person. So people are actually embracing the, you know, and I know at the beginning it was hard to stay home and do everything online, but now people are starting to embrace that. So I think we need to um, come up with more interactive ways of keeping people engaged during the the webinar, the virtually or webinars as well. Because um, I'm one that tends to, you know, get distracted pretty easily. But the turnouts are, are much are much higher, I've noticed. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, I used to teach home stretch and um, the, the uh, budgeting portion of it. And, you know, that's a long haul for a lot of families to be able to do it because maybe you're going several nights after you've worked a full day and you've left kids at home doing homework or whatever, um, you know, it might be that you've taken a full day. I know in the county I was working in, um, people were doing a full day of home stretch in order to uh, get through the process more quickly. And, you know, it's a long day sitting too. So that's great that people are willing to to do um, some online education and, and more willing to do that now and, and participate. Mm -hmm. so, so they keep ahead. it interactive. They do polls and things like that. So they, they try to keep them engaged. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's important. You know, within the actual formal learning to do um, some things that engage people, certainly. And we try to do a lot of chats and polls and depending on how people are actually joining makes a difference too, because I know Sam and I found in some of our education that people were joining on phones alone and trying to, to do Zoom and do more than a chat or a poll um, as you were working through um, Zoom on your phone uh, is sometimes difficult as well. So um, finding those ways to interact is, is sometimes difficult. I did not know you taught those courses. That's a fun, fun tip. Yeah. Um, so there are always opportunities, it seems, within um, counties and regions in order to, to do some of those things. And, um, and so through the Community Action Program, I was invited to, 
to be a part of that and actually did it for probably about maybe about 15 years doing that. So nice. So, yeah. And so um, engaging our participants. So, you know, here are just a few examples of what we might do around um, what those, what those wraparound kinds of education might look like Uh, might be audio um, the podcast kinds of things or listening to a book or, you know, somebody uh, reading something to us. It might be Twitter, Facebook. Um, We'll have some examples of this as we go along. Um, Animator, animated explainer videos, infographics. I like, I'm very visual. So as a visual learner, I like the infographics and things like that, that will show me something um, that can kind of, and when we think about keeping people engaged while they're online, some of those kinds of things that, you know, where um, we can provide some different visual or auditory kinds of things really do help as well. We see a wide variety of possibilities here, and we'll go into some detail on some of these. Um, again, military learning, family, military families learning network, now known as One Up, is. Um, very good about doing audio. Um, they do some video um, vodcasts as well. And so they have a wide variety. They often do blogs as a part of this as well so that they, um, they can share in a variety of ways. Um, there's financial podcast ideas here. Um, I checked out these links too, just to see what all was there. There's an awful lot on these two links to check out. And uh, we can we can provide those links as well, so that you have an opportunity to go and take a look at them. Um, let's see. We also, um, in t- thinking about Twitter, there are oftentimes some things that can be added to tweets along the way too, not just the. Uh, not just the thought that we're tweeting out, but it might be, you know, another resource and things. So you see here building blocks of um, military family readiness is one example. And so, you know, there's a link to go and do some additional to um, some additional reading perhaps, or listen to something. So, um, and you see on the side, looking at sharing webinar information in real time, um, if you have an archive like we typically do of a, um, a webinar, we can share that as well so that people can go and see the recorded webinar, things like that. If there are resources to add in, all of those can be provided through Twitter, it could be Facebook. Um, we're seeing a lot now of um, even doing Facebook Live through things like uh, Zoom as well. And um, I know our SNAP educators do a lot of that as well. Okay, let's see. And that's up to you. Is that right, Sam? <laughs> yep. Um, okay. Yeah, so Facebook posts. Um, I think most people are probably very familiar with Facebook, um, but you know, doing posts and you're able to schedule them in the future to be able to talk about upcoming events um, that are happening, whether that's webinars or, you know, food recalls and family development um, are food and nutrition also our health and wellness food and wellness um, also fall underneath family development um, so those things will can be shared um, using like facebook live or facebook videos to be able to um, share information out and to be able to connect with audiences and then um, also just you know different albums to be able to put in you know resources that make sense together. So in this example, the Military Families Learning Network has, you know, promoting effective parenting during deployment and reintegration. So if that's currently affecting you, you can go to that album and look at past events or upcoming events or, you know, some strategies that might work. Um, So that also makes a difference. Um, And then the next slide um, is about Um, animated explainer videos so that's just using animation instead of having you know somebody like us sit there using cute little um, characters and a voiceover and um, graphics and that kind of stuff to be able to show a concept um, to participants and that could be on YouTube and then shared 
out through um, the other social media platforms as well. Um, some people just create them on TikTok nowadays um, and then use the TikTok to share them out. Um, so depending on you know your organization, that may or may not work for you. Um, and if you're new to the whole animated explainer videos, um, uh, the next slide shows a whole bunch of different software um, that are fairly easy, easy to use. Um, and even like if you own an iPhone, iMovie is on most people's iPhones um, so that you would be able to do um, a quick video as well using that. But you know, there's um, Go Animate, Powtoons, um, Easy Sketch Pro. You can go ahead and do <laughs> try them, find the one that works for you and go from there as well. Um, and then you can also just, instead of you know having it animated, you can do a regular financial education video. Um, we have an example from Barbara O'Neill, showed on the slide, the next one, um, who is a former um, educator with Rutgers Cooperative Extension. And she just did a simple like slide share deck to be able to share um, a whole bunch of you know basics of the rule of 72 from different ones, inflation. So if you have different age groups and that kind of stuff um, that you work with, um, you can find a video appropriate for them because typically, you know, I never use this or I very rarely use the same video that I use with, you know, like my junior high age that I use with senior adults. Um, they have different needs and different understanding of concepts. So um, like this slide share from Barb is a really good resource to kind of see what is out there, what works, what may or may not fit what you're trying to do as well. Um, and then we also have the, you know, infographics, pictographs um, with Canva being coming more and more used by people. This is more or easier for us all to do, whether or not we're doing it correctly, who knows. Um, but, you know, this they're a great way to be able to capture information visually, um, as well as, you know, if you have an evaluation, you know, what what were the top five experiences of clients value, you know, I'm thinking of Jeanette, you work with Old National, like, why do people pick Old National? That could be a cool uh, pictograph of, you know, their customer service, their willingness to explain concepts, their, you know, those sorts of things that have a responding survey. Um, it's also a great way to promote events that are a little bit more visual and eye-catching. Um, but the good thing to think about with infographs and pictographs, if you're sharing them, is to also consider, you um, accessibility access for people and being able to um, have scripts so that they are be able to would be able to be read um, on social media for those people with low vision or with blindness as well. So our next one is Flipgrid um, and Flipgrid is kind of fun. It's a great way to connect with different partners, especially if you're not all in the same place. Um, I went back to school, so I'm in class as well. And um, they, all of our professors at the start of the semester, we have to do our little introduction videos on Flipgrid so that we can meet our class. Um, you know, right. so the um, Military Families Learning Network uses it to connect with their, you know, partners as well as their deployment program managers, Project Insight, a whole bunch of other places. Um, and it's kind of fun too, because you could take that and post it on your social media so that people um, can watch your Flipgrid so they get to know, like, here's our loan managers of Old National Bank, or here are the um, extension educators who work in financial capability across the state, um, and a little bit more, um, I guess a little bit more visibility and way to get to know people as well. Um, and it's super easy to do um, as well to do a Flipgrid. You really don't have to have any training um, <laughs> to make one, which is great I, think. I really like that idea thank you I haven't heard of that yeah it's a simple way to uh, introduce the a team too yeah yeah especially yeah. when you have like a new person come on board you know it'd be so easy for everybody to do a quick little flip grid and you know have them all answer a question so that you kind of get to know you um especially like yeah, anybody who started during COVID and you are working from home it's really nice to put a face with a name and to start building some sort of connection, even if it's a very quick one. So some people did that on the intro to FEC, um, but you had an option to just introduce yourself in the discussion as well. Right. So some people are very comfortable with doing something like this. Others are just not. 
Mm-hmm. So it just depends on, on comfortability level. Oh yeah, definitely. Yep. And then another, you know, one is to do texting. Um, Lori and I were part of a, you got this, we called it, and it's a texting service that goes to student age um, or parents of children who are school age. There we go. Um, and it covers finances, emotional well-being, school success, um, food and nutrition, um, that kind of stuff. And it's two text messages that go out. The parents sign up for them. Um, they can, you know, decide that they don't receive them at any point by just texting um, stop to the number. Um, we've also used them, um, used, so that one is a, a different text messaging service, but we also use a Remind um, where you can create groups, um, another text messaging app where you can either input people or they can decide to sign up. Um, we use that with our, um, uh, yeah. Okay. Yes, Youth, youth AIDS, AIDS project. project. I always want to say Youth Adult Partnerships, but that's not the right one. Youth AIDS Project. Um, and, you know, we sent financial information. We did a, a webinar on taxes and sent follow-up with that, as well as reminded them, like, here's a Zoom link for our webinar at 11 o'clock at, you know, 10 o'clock. So it's super easy to click it on your phone and go from there. Um, we did find um, it's good to have yes, those linked to additional that's okay. Resources and that, you know, participants don't want to be inundated with lots of text. So don't send them once a day. Um, we found two times a week is pretty, pretty much your max overall. Um, there's also music related to um, finances. Um, and so financialliteracymusic.com as well as Take Charge Today gives some examples. Um, but, you know, do listen to the lyrics so you know what they're all saying. Make sure they're appropriate <laughs> for the age group. Um, that there's, you know, we don't want that, that shock value unless you're going for that. Um, but that's also a fun way to, you know, what does this song teach you about this financial concept? Or what did you learn from listening to this song? It can be a good way to start or end something or to start a conversation as well. And then we also have um, a whole bunch of just children books overall are a great way um, if you work with people who ask, like, how can I teach my children about money? Um, the Consumer Financial and Protection Bureau has the Money As You Grow book club, um, and it's a whole list of books and then activities that you can do with that book about, you know, wants and needs, um, sharing, saving, spending, all the normal financial concepts. Money in the Bookshelf is very similar to that. Um, Reading Makes Sense is um, another one that uses, but through for the 4-H program. And then the Teaching Economics Using Children's Literature is from the Indiana Department of Education. Ooh. And all of them um, have a few different books. Um, I haven't looked at the Indiana one, but the other ones I know, I think all have like um, Alexander, who used to be rich last Sunday. I think all of them use that book. So it's pretty standard book for people to um, use when teaching them about money. Um, and so that's, you know, wraparounds. Um, what does that mean? And why do we want to use those wraparounds? And, you know, these are the main points is that it helps to build and strengthen engagement with participants, provides multiple, multiple touch points or entry points. Um, you know, the more times we hear a subject, we become more familiar with it, we might show more of an interest in it. Um, it can create a community of learners and doers as well. Um, it can engage multi, multi, ugh, I cannot talk, multidisciplinary participants, um, you know, informal opportunity for peer learning to, you know, well, we use this book with our children and um, this was the surprise for us, or this is what worked really well, um, those sorts of things, um, as well as, you know, using social media, making it very shareable to other people to tag their friends or family who may need who they think need to see that information or might find it useful as well. Um, it can engage multiple learning styles and intelligences, um, creates a mechan mechanism to actively listen to learners as well. There can be some of that back and forth. Um, it can assist with retention of content as well as inform programming for you um, and your organization about, you know, what should we do next? What are the questions that have come from our text messages? Um, most of those services allow the participants to text back if they have specific questions or comments as well. Um, so it's a great way to, you know, kind of extend all this stuff um, further out to everything. Um, 
All right. So as we think about, you know, that was very quick, but how much, you know, you think of utilizing wraparounds in your financial education programming or in your organization? Just the books alone are a huge tip. These are good to have maybe in the office. Sometimes we get clients that come in and they bring their kids. Mm -hmm. So it'll be a good way to keep them occupied because, you know, it's not as fun for them. Right. That's a good idea to have them handy. Our coloring books. I, I also think I've seen coloring books by um, Money, the mm -hmm. Consumer Tools and Money Safe. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a great idea to, you know, like you said, to engage the children so the parents can really focus or the parent mm -hmm. can really focus on why they came <laughs> to a meeting <laughs> for and yeah. not have to worry about like, oh, no, I forgot their toy in the car or at home or whatever. Um, so, yeah, that's a good idea. And you can always send home an activity or something too, along with the book. Um, mm -hmm. I know that that much of the uh, money as you grow bookshelf and uh, uh, money on the bookshelf, those have a lot of activities that families can do together. So sending home an activity along with, um, you know, after the child has read the book is really fun too. So mm -hmm. then they can talk about what, you know, if it's saving, what are we saving towards? What's our goal? Things like that. Um, it makes it a lot of fun for family involvement. Nice. 